Dave, you ready? Yes, sir. Whenever you are. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Glad you all could join us tonight. We appreciate you coming down tonight. We are very, very fortunate to have our partners here from the Orange County Sheriff's Department to talk about some technology to help us uh, potentially enhance the, the safety of Villa Park and the residents that live here in Villa Park. So uh, I'm certainly not gonna do a lot of speaking tonight. I'm just, call, I'm just here to welcome you. Uh, but our LEAC committee has been heavily involved with the Sheriff's Department to look at different things that we might do to enhance what's going on in the city. Uh, I believe our Mayor Pro Tem is involved with the LEAC committee heavily. And I don't know if you wanna say anything or not, but uh, welcome you and Ruben here tonight. Um, and thank you for coming, all of you for coming. Uh, this is really an opportunity for us to share information with you, um, ask questions, um, and we probably will, this won't be the last time that we have one of these. It'll probably be multiple uh, opportunities for us to share information with you. But we're just, we're looking into things. We're wanting to get opinions and things like that over time uh, and see what we want to do and what direction we want to take. We're very fortunate to have Dave here Want to know with the sheriff's department, he's in technology, and he's going to spend some time and talk to you a little bit about what, what's available out there. And AJ has been kind enough to be here with us as well tonight. So he's in charge of this area and the deputies that serve us. So appreciate you all being here tonight, and thank you very much. Just make sure we talk into the microphones because there's folks out there that are watching this tonight, and so we want to make sure we share it with them as well. Okay? So Dave, I'll turn it over to you or AJ. Okay. Thank you, sir. Cool. So if you don't know me, AJ Patella, I'm the uh, city chief here, for lack of better terms. Um, I brought with me Dave Fontenot. So he is the director of our technology division. And our technology division is the, the f future of the sheriff's department. Um, everything that we do as far as responding to crimes in progress and investigating crimes that have already occurred is being fueled by the stuff that they're putting out right now. Also in the back, I have a uh, deputy, or actually investigator Fowler, my apologies, sir. We're all deputy sheriffs at heart, right? So um, so he, he's one of our uh, investigators assigned to, uh, to Villa Park, and uh, Christian Heyman is the sergeant in charge of investigations for Villa Park. So, and the reason I brought everybody here is for basically that Q&A session to kind of answer any questions, maybe give you some success stories, some horror stories of other things that haven't worked. Um, and I actually, we're gonna have another deputy stop by too. So ask good questions. We'll try to give you good answers. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass it over to Dave, the, uh, the expert on the matter. Well, I don't know about expert, but uh, we're gonna have some fun. So, and I hate having to use a mic. Maybe we can, because I like walking around. Can you guys, can you guys hear me here? Okay, so we'll do it this way, unless I'm gonna be in trouble with the camera. But uh, anyway, my name is Dave Fontenot. I uh, oversee our technology. I serve as the CIO for the sheriff here in Orange County. And uh, the chief uh, mentioned technology. And it's interesting, I've had the opportunity to speak to a number of groups in a number of cities uh, over the last year or so as we're rolling out uh, new technology here. And uh, normally we kind of do a, a fancy PowerPoint and uh, you know, a little a dog and pony show, but we wanted to be in this format. We wanted to do this more informal I was told it was gonna be a smaller group and it was really more of a Q&A session. So we wanted to kind of keep it that, that informal um, stature with everyone here. So I want everybody to make this interactive and not just me up here talking. So please, as we move along, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. And uh, we're just gonna share what we're doing and hopefully that will generate some questions. Um, but as the chief mentioned, um, we are on a path to modernizing our technology here in Orange County. And in full transparency, I will share with you that technology has not always been our strong suit. And we are a fairly new division within the Sheriff's Department, uh, that being the technology division. Even though obviously we've always had technology that's been associated and, and supporting our, our first responders. but it wasn't given the priority or the focus that the sheriff has given it in the last three and a half years. So the sheriff, I think he's got a really good sense of humor because the same week COVID hit in March of 2020, 
he decided to do a major reorganization of the department and form the new technology division. And it's really made up of two disparate divisions. One was our, what we called previously our communications division, which oversaw anything radio, um, anything that goes in the cars, MDCs, radios. And, and a lot of people don't realize the sheriff supports the radio system for the entire county, not just sheriff's jurisdiction. So about 22,000 users and about 100 different agencies across the county. And then we had our IT and systems group, <clears throat> which was part of a, another division, which we used to call our support services division. And so in March of 2020, we brought anything technology related together to form this new technology division. And as the chief mentioned, um, at that time, we did an assessment and really took a look at how we infuse technology into what our first responders do. And what we saw was, and we heard from them, we heard from our technologists, our experts, um, that we were not really doing a good job. There was a lot of other things we could do. So we set about in March of 2020 to modernize and really take advantage of some of the new breakthroughs in technologies that we all see on the news every night. You know, you, you, can't, you can't watch the news, I think, these days without hearing the word AI um, in, infused somewhere in there, right? And what we don't realize is we're all using AI or artificial intelligence every day, whether it be, you know, me talking to Siri to send a text or ask for directions or Alexa or many other things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in our cars, in our homes, uh, we're surrounded by artificial intelligence. And that reliance is only going to grow day by day, and it's growing exponentially. Um, one, and, and the mayor talked about, you know, we will have future um, meetings like this. And I'll bring, next time we come out and talk, I'll bring one of the presentations that I show. And I love this one slide that we put together. And what it does, it's, it's this graph that shows in, from 2000 up through 2020. And what it shows is how, how the, our, our technology remained fairly flat. The use of data, the use of AI, things like that remained fairly flat. But over the last five years, this chart just goes like this, and it just goes straight up. And that's only going to continue as, it, as those kind of technologies creep into everything that we do. And there's some great benefits to that. Um, and what we are trying to do is really harness those benefits for the safety of the communities that we police and to provide the support for our first responders out in the field. And we feel we're on a, a very solid path to do that. Um, now, we have a lot of work to do. We've done a lot of work compared to where we were in March of 2020. And, but we still have a lot of work to do to get us to where we want to be. And that leads me to a point that in policing, the way we've historically addressed technology and addressed problems like that is we were very good and we are very good at identifying a problem, coming up with a solution, and implementing that solution. But then historically, and typically what we do is, we then move on to the next problem. And we, we leave this one to fester. We do not innovate. We do not maintain the look of that or the continual innovation. So we're really changing the paradigm at how we look at technology. And we're really moving into a continuous innovation format to where we will constantly be upgrading, constantly be looking at innovation. And we really have to do that, or we're going to get left behind. Um, there's a statistic out there that shows two thirds of businesses will not exist five years from now in their current format if they don't make some kind of radical change. And that's really along the same lines of what we're doing. We, we looked at, at things like that, and we say, well, how do we apply the private sector to the public sector. And really, it's all wrapped around technology. And so that's really a long way of getting around to where are we headed today? How, what are we doing to make things safer for communities like Villa Park? What are we doing to provide better solutions, better technology for our first responders in the field? One of those things that we're doing is automated license plate readers. That's what we're here to talk about today. But what I want to share with you is the automated license plate readers are just one spoke in, in this wheel that we have 
of many different spokes of technology as we stand up are what we're calling the Orange County Real-Time Operations Center. A lot of people will refer to it as a real-time crime center, but it's really, it does so much more than just address crime. It addresses all kinds of things from fires to traffic collisions to lost persons. So it's really, we're calling it a real-time operations center. And you'll notice that I didn't call it the Sheriff's Real-Time Operations Center. I called it the Orange County Real-Time Operations Center. And that's because the Sheriff has a vision where this is a multi-jurisdictional facility. It's a multi-jurisdictional approach. And what we envision, once this is open and operating at full capacity, is that you might have not just Orange County Sheriff's deputies in this facility, but you'll have uniforms from other municipalities that aren't necessarily part of the contract city partners that we police. So for example, you could have some smaller municipalities in there, some larger ones, sitting side by side with sheriff's deputies and investigators that are working together to solve crime and keep our communities safer. The key, there's two key things that are going to make a real-time operations center successful. And we've had the opportunity to visit these centers all across the country. In fact, last week I was in New Orleans and Atlanta visiting those centers and interfacing with our partners in those parts of the country. And we were learning best practices from folks who are already using these types of technologies across the country. And I've probably visited a dozen different centers all across the country now, and I've learned a great deal, and we still have a great deal more to learn. We're not even up and running yet or open, but we're learning how are we going to do it better than everyone else because we want to provide the best solutions for our residents to include Villa Park. But the two things that stand out as we interface with our partners and we collaborate and share these ideas and strategies across the country, there's two things that stand out in successful operations. Number one, is the use of automated license plate readers, or ALPR, or LPRs. There's a variety of different acronyms. That's number one. The second is video integration. But the successful commonalities that we've seen in the agencies providing great support for their communities, and they've come right out and told us, the communities have shared with us, is the, the strategic use of license plate readers and the strategic use of integrated video. And those are key. So those are two things that we are implementing and going to use strategically in our real-time operations center. Now, a lot of people may not realize, but the use of license plate readers have been in use in Orange County and by the Sheriff's Department for many years. We've used those for many years successfully. We just don't have that many of them in the past. Uh, we've current, we've We've since, with many of our contract city partners, we've increased that number exponentially. We've got over 250 uh, license plate readers cam cameras out there right now in service. Um, there's many more coming online uh, every week and every month. Uh, the city of Rancho Santa Margarita, I believe just this week, their council approved a contract to add additional cameras along with some what we call um, strategic pan tilt zoom cameras that will be taken right in. Those fees will allow our operators and our deputies in the real-time operations center to literally proactive, proactively address crime in certain areas of their communities. So those are the two primary things that we'll talk about tonight in terms of the use of license plate readers and the use of video in our real-time operations center. But let's, let's focus, because I know today's uh, topic is centered around the license plate reader. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. The first thing I want to share with you is we are not here to sell anything. We're not here promoting one brand over the other. There's a, a number of different companies that provide and support license plate reader cameras. Um, we are agnostic. We're making sure that the technologies we use in our real-time operations centers and the technologies that we provide to our deputies in the field are agnostic to any particular brand. So one community might have one brand of license plate readers, another might have another, and so on and so forth. We can ingest, we're making sure we have the infrastructure and the backbone to ingest any type of technology that a community chooses 
to implement. And that's important because you know, we're not here to promote or support any particular brand. Um, we will certainly recommend and we'll share with you um, companies that we've seen work well, but there's a number of them out there and we'll be happy if you choose to go that route eventually, we'll be happy to walk side by side with you and partner with you to help you get the best solution for your community. And again, there's a variety of them out there. And one of the things we're doing, we're constantly looking at new technologies. Uh, we'll be in, we'll be in uh, Cupertino next week uh, working with Apple on some uh, partnership projects which will involve these types of technology. And the following week we'll be in San Diego um, where we'll be all of the vendors that support and provide this type of technology will be there. So we'll be looking at the latest and greatest and best practices from these different agencies. But I share that just from the standpoint is it's important for you to know that we're really taking this road that we're on very seriously in how we're investing our time and our resources to make sure that we give you that best technology, that best support. And again, like I shared in full transparency, we haven't always done that. You know, we've, we've implemented solutions and we've moved on and we're really going to change how we do that. When we talk about license plate reader cameras, there's a variety of different solutions that you can utilize. Um, right now, you may not realize, but all of our patrol cars are being outfitted with new in-car uh, video systems. So we've had, we've had in-car video for many, many years. In fact, Orange County was one of the pioneers back in the day when we actually had uh, VHS tapes in the trunks and the deputies would have to change out the tapes and then they went to a, a smaller tape, like a eight millimeter, and, and then we went to a digital solution and now we're literally just finishing up the implementation of a new digital solution that pairs with our body cams. So it syncs that in-car video with our body cams that the deputies wear. But what a lot of people don't realize is those cameras that we're putting in the cars that are replacing our older solution also have a license plate reader function in them. And what that means is that every single patrol car we have out in our communities will now also be license plate reader capable. Whereas in the past, we only had certain designated vehicles that had that technology in them. And they were, it was very expensive. And while it's still not cheap, it is much less expensive and it's better technology that we're implementing right now. So that's one aspect of license plate readers. That's an aspect that we've had, as I touched on, we've had for many years, we're just you know, increasing the use of that in the cars now. The other option that a lot of communities are going with are fixed license plate reader cameras um, in different locations within their communities. And those are put up by the municipality and they're put up at various intersections. A lot of communities choose to put those up at the entrances and exits of their communities. Uh, they choose to put them up in areas where perhaps They've had certain issues uh, with certain types of crime or problems. They'll put them up there. Um, and then the other way those cameras are utilized is by individual homeowners associations. So we have a number of homeowners associations throughout the county that have purchased those license plate reader cameras for their individual communities. And in those cases, they typically put them at the entrance and exits of their communities. In fact, the community I live in has that, and we, uh, through our association, you know, we pay for those and we provide that information directly to the law enforcement agency where I live, and it's been a great tool I can share just from as a resident as well. But that's how those cameras work. Um, and then the other option that some communities are choosing to go with are a multi-use camera. And the way that works is Santa Margarita just uh, approved, their city council approved this week. So in that case, you might have a camera up on a light pole, a city-owned light pole that provides license plate reader capability, but it also provides surveillance capability from the standpoint of um, pan, tilt, zoom. So what that would do, it would allow the city or the operator in the real-time operations center uh, focus in on a particular problem area. 
For example, one way the city might use that type of camera is for traffic counts. So those cameras, the traffic engineering departments within cities love those cameras because they can use it for traffic counts, they can use it for engineering analysis and studies. So it's really a multi-purpose camera. And then the operator in the real-time crime center might use it. Let's say a crime occurred at a particular location and that there happened to be a camera there. Well, that, that operator within the real-time operations center can go back and look and pull extract video from that and actually be able to help solve the crime. And I know we have a couple of recent crimes that were solved here that we'll talk about in a little bit um, with the use of our uh, license plate reader cameras. So there's a variety of different things we can do uh, with that type of technology there. If we use, we talked early on, we talked about artificial intelligence. And, and along with that, we have machine learning or what, what they call ML. So you've heard of AI, you're gonna hear a lot more about ML as, as our machines become smarter and they start learning things and learning how to do things. And we can overlay AI and ML on top of some of these cameras and use them in a very proactive sense. And what I mean by that is, let's say the Ralph's right here that someone goes in and robs that, that store and they leave and we have a, a, a description of the vehicle on which way they went. So what proactively we can do, if we had cameras in this area, we can add, the cameras will read object detection. And what I mean by that is with AI, if let's say hypothetically it's a red pickup truck and maybe it's got a, you know, a spare tire on the back, you know, you could pick any scenario. Well, we can enter that into the system. And now instead of the deputies having to go out and look for that truck, the cameras we have on our network will proactively look for that truck. And we've had success with that type of activity and technology. So that, those, that's just a very um, minor example of how that might be used proactively. If we tie that into our 911 system now, which we are doing, so now when the person that just got robbed at the Ralph's using that scenario dials 911, the system's going to immediately know, hey, you've got cameras in this parking lot or you've got cameras at City Hall or you've got a camera out at that intersection and it's gonna immediately light up those cameras and it's gonna tell the operator who's taking that 911 call as well as the deputies or investigators in the real-time operations center, that there's a robbery that just occurred, here's the cameras, we're gonna rewind three minutes and we're gonna be able to see every car that leaves that parking lot or that comes down that street. So those are just some very high level examples of how this technology can be used to keep the community safe out there. Um, I think this is a good time to segue into our um, recent case uh, that if we want to talk about how we use those cameras to solve a, a pretty good crime that probably would have gone unsolved had it not been for some technology that we had. Do we want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm uh, Kristen Heyman. I'm the investigative sergeant for this area uh, for North. Um, a little bit about me. I grew up in Anaheim Hills. My parents still currently live there, so this community, it's right down the street. It's important to me. Um, in the back is one of my investigators. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, you guys have seen, but there was a new a press release just recently that went out, I think, last week. It was reference uh, a bank jugging. So what that means is basically um, some of these criminals are kind of coming down, casing various parking lots, uh, looking for victims who come in and out of the banks um, with basically envelopes of cash or watching them tra do transactions inside the banks and then following them back home uh, in their vehicles. So this case happened out of Rossmore. This uh, lady went into the bank, took out $50,000 of cash, uh, put it back in her vehicle, went home, noticed the vehicle was kind of following her but wasn't really sure, pulled up into her driveway, um, the vehicle was following her. As soon as she was still inside her vehicle, uh, two suspects approached the vehicle, one at the driver's side window, the other one at the rear. She didn't know the other individual was at the rear passenger area going through her vehicle. 
the, the one at the driver's seat was distracting her. Um, meanwhile, the second suspect took the money from her vehicle and took off. Um, basically, by the use of these cameras, these LPRs and flock system, we were, we were able to trace, retrace her steps um, on the highway, and we actually found a vehicle following her within four seconds, which gave us a, a license plate, and then we were able to track down that um, Hertz rental car, the, the suspects that actually rented the vehicle uh, within a day, and uh, we were able to obtain information of that suspect through that. I'll let my uh, investigator kind of just give a little, a tidbit of, he was the, actually the, the individual on the call. So, Moni, if you could give a few. Yeah, I think because people are watching. Hello. My name is Investigator Fowler. I'm 105 Investigator for uh, North Operations. Uh, I work a lot of um, overtime as, as a regular deputy. Um, this call came out on Tuesday. Um, pretty much a um, uh, female is reporting that she went to the bank and she was followed home um, and she has a video of it. So I'm like, good. I didn't think it was she was a victim yet up until I talked to her and she said, yeah, I lost the envelope. I think they took it and it had $50,000 in it. Now, um, this in, uh, the victim is 80 years old, a widow. Nobody else in the world, she withdrew that money to send it back to her family in Germany where sick, they need uh, money. <clears throat> so her neighbor was able to get uh, ring camera footage and she showed it to me. It was just a silver Toyota Camry. I'm a car nerd. I, she said it was an Acura. It was actually a Toyota. So I asked her uh, to retrace her route back home. She told me the streets. Luckily, one of the intersections she drove through had a flock camera. So I um, wrote the report. Next morning in the office, I ran um, her license plate because I don't have a license plate on the victim's car. So I found her exactly where she said she was going, the direction she was ro rolling in. Unfortunately, the flock camera, once it takes a picture, it's just it's three quick pictures of that license plate as it goes through. There's no silver car around it. So what I did was change the parameters of the search for 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after. And I got lucky. Five seconds behind her in the same lane was that same silver car. Uh, ran the plate, came back to Hertz. I know uh, crown rolls, um, they think they can outsmart law enforcement by renting them. Um, so contacted Hertz. We have contacts to everybody and uh, was able to obtain the rental agreement, name suspect with his phone number and his address. <clears throat> Once I have that, I gave it to our undercover units, the North Direct Enforcement Team, um, because the, the house they were living at was in Riverside County, San Bernardino County. They were able to roll up by the house. They ID'd the person. Um, they surveilled them for a couple of days and noticed that they go from Laguna Woods to Costa Mesa, Santa Ana, always to a bank, always targeting elderly people. What they do is watch them go inside the bank. They follow them in the bank. They see if they're making a lar large withdrawal. Um, and then they just follow them out. And they use the distraction uh, technique. Um, one will talk to them while the other one um, looks, looks inside their bag. Yeah. How did you say this lady lived in? What town? Rossmore. Yes, ma'am. It's right next to Seal Beach and Los Alamitos. Yeah, it's one of our um, areas, uh, jurisdiction. Right. Right. But, um, I mean, this particular crew always um, um, were choosing elderly people. Was there any, enough of an investigation on what she really was taking out that kind of money? Because there's a lot of thing with the seniors where... There's a scam of yeah. their children need money or their grandchildren. I don't think the majority of us, and I'm surely a senior, right. would go out and take out 50000 just to send it to Germany. So that doesn't I, I understand, and I talked to her about it. I just want to make sure she, she was not oh, okay. a part of a scam. Yeah, I know it's 50, that just doesn't. Right. Well, she has no, no daughters. I, 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 made, I made sure she, she was comfortable with me. Like, hey, if it's a scam, it's okay. Let me know what happened. She's like, no, I've done it before. I have no children. My husband just passed away not too long ago. I have nobody in the U.S., but I do have a lot. She immigrated from Germany, so she has an extended family in Germany who she's well off, and she's sending them money because some of them need medical care. And the way she does it is to take the cash, change it to Bitcoin, and then send it over so she doesn't have to use the transfer. Old people are taking out money. I mean, you just don't 
go even to the Rossmore banks and sit around looking for somebody to take out 50000 Well, be more this bank in particular, ma'am, was in Huntington Beach. Um, and it was a bank that was... That, okay. All right. Anyway, this bank was... It deals with a lot of contractors, so there's a large amount of cash because contractors use a lot of cash. And that's one she chooses to, and she's done it before. Um, in this case, we were able to surveil them, catch them almost surveilling uh, different banks. Uh, the, the deputies detained them, um, and we were able to get a confession out of them. That is what they did. They admitted to the crime. We, uh, we served a search warrant on their house. We found, uh, on, on their person, we found $15,000 in cash that they just took off of somebody earlier in the day that we didn't catch. In their house, there was another five, ten, ten thousand dollars $10,000 that we were able to recover. Um, they copped to the whole thing. Um, they admitted that that was them in Rossmore. They've done it before. They just came through the U.S., walked across the southern border into the U.S., and that's what they did. Would the DA do something about it? Of course. They're still as in jail. As far as I know, they don't. I'm sorry? I read the papers. Yes, sir. And they do nothing. Far off track because we can go into the, the details of these, yeah. of these cases, and I would love to talk to him about it. But we want to kind of the point of the story is to show how the LPRs helped catch the criminals. And trust me, every point you're making, we were talking about it too. So, um, but I don't want us to get us too far off track to keep in. No, did great questions, I love them. But I want to make sure that we're staying on somewhat on topic. So, does that make sense? Yeah. But basically, with, with, with these cameras, okay, um, it gives our investigators, our sheriff's department, an opportunity to actually hold these criminals accountable, okay? Because these crews, a lot of these residential burglaries that you guys are seeing on the news, okay, they're coming in, they're wearing all black, they're wearing ski masks, they're wearing gloves, okay? So it's very, we're not going to get DNA, DNA most of the time from the res, okay? So the only... The only tools we have is video, is LPR, is flock cameras coming in out of the out of the uh, smaller communities. Um, that's how we're able to helpfully like catch these individuals. Um, so the bottom line is, it's a tool for us to try to apprehend these suspects, try to hold them accountable. Um, because let's let's be honest, they're not from this area, right? They're coming here from LA County, okay, or Riverside County. Uh, I get uh, residential burglary reports on my desk every day, okay, from communities like Villa Park, Rossmore, uh, unincorporated Tustin, unincorporated Santa Ana, okay, nice homes that are getting burglari burglarized, and they're the same type of crews, right? They're, they're running three to four crews, and they're from L.A. County. These are Crips. These are Bloods. They're not like your nice people, okay? So one of the tools is the camera system, is getting the license plate, tracking them down, getting up on on phones as fast as we can. And with the cameras, we're able to identify these vehicles that are either stolen or registered to LA County addresses. And that way we can put a team on it and hopefully recoup what was taken and at least put them in jail. So that's kind of, it's just another tool for our investigation to assist you guys in the community. That's, that's, and we have success with them. So. And if I can piggyback on that, I, I personally, I, I love Flock because not just an LPR, it's not a license plate reader. Some cars don't have um, license plates, but I can put in the make, model, characteristic truck or something that will actually capture that. It will capture the fingerprint of the vehicle. Sometimes all we have is a black truck. So I can just put in there, black truck, during this time frame, it will give me every black truck. It just gives us leads. Okay, other than that, we have, nobody, we have no idea who, who did it. For example, Ralph's right here. Phenomenal management team. They're always helpful with us. Their cameras show me that the crime did occur in the, in the parking lot, but it's so outdated there's no evidentiary value to it. It shows me a pixel of an individual bumping into another person where if they would get a better high resolution cameras, I can zoom in, I can get features, I can, I can put it on bolos, send it out to um, other jurisdictions to try to identify these suspects. Just because I, I know that crime occurred here. I have video that the crime occurred here, but not enough detail for us to work the case properly. So... Um, we've heard you for we've heard you speak now for about 35 minutes about how, how effective your equipment is, and I agree it's a wonderful thing and a tool for you. 
Now, I think the people are here to find out what they dislike about the system, and what do you have to say about that? Well, we'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, why don't you ask? What, so, I yeah, so let's, I let's go. Right about that. What do you yeah. do with the data? This is what I'm worried about. Sure. You guys, no, no, I'm fine. You guys with the data, I am fine. I'm worried about Sacramento and Washington, D.C. We've seen it the last three years. We've seen it five years, ten years back, how people are misusing this data. And that's what, that's what we're worried about. Yeah. That's what I'm worried about. I think, I think Wayne is, too. Yeah, so it's a, you guys we trust. Yeah, so it's a great it's a great question. So the data is uh, it's fully encrypted. It's sent to the cloud in a, in a what we call a Sieges uh, protected cloud in a, in a Gov cloud AWS. It's retained for thirty days, and then unless it's taken as evidence by one of our investigators or deputy, which is put into our secure area, then it's automatically deleted. Oh, where does the deletion go? Because we know from all the meta data that they collected over the last 10 years or so, that that's not quite true. It is somewhere. So how do you destroy it so it's, it's, completely? So what I can tell you is the metadata and the uh, picture of the car is fully deleted after 30 days. Um, what we can do, you know, if, if, if this is something, you know, I can, I can share with you, that's our, we've done, we've done our due diligence. We're very comfortable that that data is being fully deleted after 30 days. Um, but what we can do if, you know, in our next talk is we can actually have a representative from the different companies come in here and they'd be happy to share with you how they do that deletion. But it's, it's it, I can tell you we're very comfortable with the way the data is being handled. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. We've looked at a, a variety of solutions out there. Um, we're very comfortable with this. We're not going to put the sheriff, the department, our citizens at risk by... Um, doing something that would, would harm you or the communities that we serve. Well, actually, I'd be quite frank with you. I'm worried about the federal government spying on all of us. Well, be quite frank. understood. Yeah, and, I, and obviously I can't speak to that, right? I mean, but I mean, there's, if the federal government's going to spy on us, the, the, the data is going to be the last thing we worry about, right? I mean, they could listen in on our phone calls. I mean, there's people that we could talk about conspiracy theories and how they, the CIA or different governmental agencies do what they do. Um, but we're here to try to focus on that. All I can tell you is that we've looked at the data retention, how they delete it. We're very comfortable with it. Um, what the federal government does, I, I can't speak to that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I could, and, and again, I, I fully respect the question. I respect you, and we, we have a great rapport. But I could, I could say that about anything, right? Everything we're doing, um, I, could, I could say that, that same scenario. And there's, I don't know that we have a way to prove or disprove that, right? All of, our, all of the banking transactions I do or... You know, anything we do with technology, and technology touches everything we do now, right? We, we're, we can't get away from it. It's interesting, about 15, sadly, I'm dating myself, maybe 20 years ago, I sat through a presentation in, one, in a different city, and uh, it was a data analytics company that came in and talked about some of the things that you're talking about, and the, the amount of data that we touch and this is many years ago, so it's, it's much greater today. But the point I'm making is I walked out of there, and I went home, and I told my wife, I says, okay, the only way to avoid this is to use cash, right? Because every credit card transaction, because there are companies out there that buy, our, and it's fully legal, right? Whether you use a, a Visa or a MasterCard, American Express. So I understand your concerns, and... Um, you know, I, I don't have an answer for what the federal government does or doesn't do. What I can tell you is we don't store it. The vendor doesn't store it after 30 days, and it's in an encrypted state that even if someone were to get it, they need an encryption key to unlock it and to view it. Um, so we've taken that very seriously. We've done, you know, our due diligence that we feel we're, we're comfortable with that. And we've been using the technology now for some time. There are many other communities using it across the country, um, and we haven't had those issues of a data breach um, with that technology. Uh, 
I, I wonder how many in the room here, I wish there was more people, have uh, typed into their browser, their computer, their own name and the city of Villa Park or whatever city. Have you ever done that? Do that tonight and see for yourself. You'll find I can not only know your address, your telephone number, I can find out what, city, what uh, activities you're doing. I can learn everything with just that information alone, and that's just a starter. Behind that, you will note when you do this, there are companies that can provide you far more information for a few dollars. The world of privacy doesn't exist anymore. And I'm on the, on the uh, uh, grateful to be on the, uh, uh, what do we call ourselves? Law Enforcement Advisory Committee to the Council. And our purpose is just this, is to keep people safe. Mary and I are neighborhood watch captains, have been for, I don't know, 25 years. And we've lowered, thanks to the, our Sheriff's Department, lowered the crime rate in Villa Park and also in Yorba Linda where they serve in place of, an, of a local fire or a police department. So, so people, we gotta come of age. We have to learn how, how, how transparent our lives are. And it's scary. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. And, and you do bring up a good point. Um, you know, there, there's statistics out there. I don't have them. But when we walk, when we drive, you know, we go in a business, we go in a bank, a shopping center, we're, we're on camera many hundreds of times a day if we're active and out there, right, to your point. Um, this is another piece of that technology. The good thing is we're managing the technology and we are monitoring it. We're making sure that it's secure, encrypted, and deleted after 30 days. Um, we're using it to our benefit. You heard from the sergeant and the detective that a, a community like Rossmore, which is very demographically, I would argue, very similar to Villa Park, a very you know uh, similar demographics. These types of crimes happen can happen anywhere. And what we're proposing are solutions to keep you all safe in this environment that we live in now. I mean, we can turn on the news every night at 11 and sadly, it doesn't start out good, right? It typically starts out with what kind of violent crime happened in the Southland somewhere. And so what we're doing as good stewards of our resources and trying to provide you with the best public safety solutions we can, in addition to these great men and women that are out here every day risking their lives, is the technology behind them to provide the great success stories that we just heard in that one little case. There's another great case they just solved this week involving an armed burglar who, yeah, who, who she's, she's got it. Who would like to ask a question? I would, like, I would like to say that I would hope you would keep the information more than 30 days because there's sometime crimes that last a lot longer. I think we're all, very naive if they if we don't realize that there's so much information on us now i mean if you have a, a telephone if you have a cell phone they can go back years and pick up different where you were and stuff so i don't think you should be worried about this at all i think the only people that really should be worried about it is people that are doing things that are not really very good my question on this is, and as far as what the federal government does it, you're right, they might come in on it because if it goes across lines, it might be theirs, they may get it, just like they can get your bank cards, they can get your cell stuff. So if they're gonna get this, they're gonna get it anyhow. So I don't think we should worry about it. Um, but the one question I have regarding it is, who pays for the technology, the initial investments, and the ongoing investment, is that part of the sheriff's contract with the city, or is this a additional fee, and how much is it? So great question. And let me start by, it depends on the technology you're talking about. So if we focus in, I'm trying to keep it for the chief on the license plate readers, right, that would be purchased and maintained by the individual city. And, it, and the cost depends on... I, I don't, it's, I don't, and, it, and the reason, yeah. So you guys have some of that already? We've looked at 
There's different companies. Yeah. It, it can vary from, you know, $2,000, $2,500 per camera uh, per year, it, and it varies. Um, and it goes up from there depending on the technology, what type of camera, how many cameras, are we going to add AI to the camera, um, is it a pan tilt zoom camera? Um, so it really varies. Uh, we don't. We, that's why we don't want to get into the pricing because we're not here to sell you anything. We're here to talk about the technology and the benefits. If you move to a point with your committee proposing to your council, um, then what you could do is have different vendors come in and give presentations on the technology that they would propose, as well as the costs and how those things would work. And we'll be there to support that as well. Okay. Yeah. And we can help you do that. Once you narrow down that you definitely want to move in that direction, we'll be happy to help you pick a technology and help you even down to placement. We'll, we're there to support you through this process. We're not, we're not there yet, folks, in terms of yeah. our evaluation of what's going on. Right now, it's a concept. <clears throat> We're not ready to put numbers on it. We're not ready to pick vendors. Uh, there's, you know, like he said, he's going to San Diego to see a multitude of vendors. We've only talked to a couple, and we're just doing some due diligence right now. But we don't, we're not ready to bring something to the council or to the table to offer to you because it's very important that we have your input in terms of how we set the direction. You know, we don't want to do this on our own. So that's why we're doing these town halls and bringing everybody together to get your insight. And, and all of us are experts in different ways. So if we gather the information from all of you, then we'll come up with a potential solution that will satisfy everybody, hopefully, at some point. But we're not ready right now to do this. This is kind of like, yeah. You know, yes, sir. One thought and one question. Um, <clears throat> first, there's a higher probability we're probably going to be a victim of a burglary here in Villa Park rather than the CIA or DEA or somebody, you know, uh, and a conspiracy to, to get us. Uh, but the retention, for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, does that also increase the price if we want it for 90 days, for instance, to retain So again, the data? I, I'm not going to get into pricing because I don't know that. We have different technologies with different retention periods. I just pulled the 30 days because there is one vendor that's very popular amongst many of the contract cities. They have a 30-day policy. But we can, those are things we can set, you know, for the particular community. We have other technologies that we use internally where we have a two-year, uh, you know, data retention. Uh, but again, that's, we're not talking about the same technology here. And just to give you guys an idea, when we do get a report that comes across my desk of a residential burglary that just occurred, I usually get that report within one to two days. And then my investigator gets it right away. And they're looking at the cameras, the systems, like within no longer than a week. So once we see that certain vehicles need to be looked at or, or individuals, we're on it pretty fast because we know that these guys are changing cars. You know, they're working, quick, they're working quickly, so we want to work just as fast. So we're, we're up on it within a week. So just to, kind of, just to give you guys a, head, a, like a little bit of a retention issue. I'm curious, we were burglarized three years ago in Villa Park pretty badly. Um, we, had, we had cameras. The police got there two minutes after they pulled out of our driveway. We got all that on the cameras. Um, maybe I'm just personally feeling sorry for myself. We didn't see any follow through. They, they came out the front door laughing with all of our goods. They were clearly caught on the camera. We have pictures of them breaking in the door. Um, are, uh, have you advanced a lot from three years ago? I mean, I'm hearing you're on these cases, and we never got the feeling. We, we paid to have them cut all of our uh, photography off of our cameras. We paid someone to do that so that you had all these pictures. We did have someone contact us a couple months ago and said he's investigating crimes that don't have any follow through and he was some kind of a journalist. I don't know how he got our information, but he did. Yeah. So it's a great question and the, the answer is definitely yes. So we have much better technology than we did just three years ago. You know, I started my talk 
talking about how we didn't have the greatest technology three, three and a half years ago. And we're on a journey to change that. And, and if we're doing our job right, three years from now, we're going to even have better technology in three years and so forth. Because exponentially, that technology is changing so quickly that we have to keep up with that. Um, but yes, to answer, first off, my, you know, my sincere apology that we haven't, but I know I see the sergeant reaching out and we'll, we'll take a look at that again. But the technology that we're talking about here today is going to allow, sadly, victims like yourself hopefully have a much higher percentage of a positive outcome at the end of that case. Um, you know, because we, we need technology. You know, burglaries are a very common, you know, uh, you heard the sergeant talk about how burglaries are happening every, every day in our communities. And I'll add to that, you because you kind of, you painted a picture of how quickly we got there, how quickly we had the information with the new systems that we have in place. We don't have to wait till it hits Kristen's desk. Our deputies in the field can access that stuff immediately and they can see exactly where that person's going. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty impressive to watch real time. Um, it's just getting better every day, so. I mean, there's a, I mean we, could, we literally could make a four hour talk about technologies we're looking at, technologies that are coming down our roadmap that aren't in place today that are gonna make cases like yours have a much greater chance for success. Um, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's actually very exciting from a, a citizen standpoint to see what's coming down the road. And we're, we're very excited to be here tonight and, and, and on the path we're moving because it is going to make it, you know, we're, we're shifting that ball over to the, the, the side of the field with the, with the victims where I think the sad part is over the last number of years, it's been on the side with the, the bad guys. And we're trying to move that ball down the field to our side to help folks like you. Yes, sir. Yeah, so as I'm understanding it, like what happened at her house, and if you had the stationary cameras out, say you didn't get her license plate, the license plate, but a stationary camera, it gets alerted, and they could pick up a license plate maybe, and you'd have more yeah, of a so chance to catch them. 100%. So using her example, exactly where we arrived two minutes after the suspects left, okay? You have a, with cameras in the community, now our, our operators in the real-time operations center, as well as, as the chief said, the deputies in the car can do it as well. We're gonna immediately go back and start looking two minutes back, in, in five minutes back, and we're gonna start looking for the camera, especially in a smaller community where we can really focus in, like Villa Park. Um, the, the likelihood of a successful apprehension is going to go up exponentially. Uh, yes, sir. Again, uh, I'm curious about the uh, deployment. Uh, I mean, I realize now that uh, we're not very far along in this process. What do you suspect we should have as far as locations for these cameras? Well, it's a great question. So if the city council and the city decide to move in that direction, then what we would do is we would work your, with your chief of police, your investigators, your community, and we would make that determination. We wouldn't just randomly do that. We would look at your crime stats. We'd look at where are the crimes occurring? Where are your trouble spots? We'd look at how do people egress the city? How do people get in and egress, out of egress, the city? Yeah. Yes, and we would initially target those areas. The nice thing is, in a smaller community, it's much easier to do. You can, you can really blanket your perimeter uh, fairly nice, you know, as opposed to some of the larger cities, it's a much more costly endeavor. Um, but many communities, even larger ones, are doing Anaheim, you know, is, is putting a lot of money and resources into license plate reader cameras. They're standing up a real-time operations center just like we are, and we're working with them to share that data back and forth because we all know, as you just heard in this example case given, that the bad guys <clears throat> come from other areas, right? whether it be in Orange County and they're traversing city boundaries or in many cases, as the sergeant indicated, they're coming from out of the county. And because of that, we're working with our partners in other counties as well to create this network of connectivity so that we can literally track these, these bad guys down regardless of where they live. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> yes, sir. Have this work? Um, yeah, so I agree that uh, it's a constant battle, right? Technology is, is 
always moving and you never catch it. Um, just a question on these cities that have implemented this, this already. Um, have they looked into the commercialization of any of the data? I mean, I'm sure insurance companies and other things would be very interested. I mean, the example I'll use is, uh, you know, when uh, Google puts out all the cameras of, on everybody's house, right? Now they know you have a trampoline or a swimming pool, <laughs> and, and they sell that data to the insurance guys. Not that that's a bad thing in every case, but it is more of an intrusion on yeah. privacy. No, great question, and the answer is unequivocally no, they're not. So all of the communities have the same concerns that you're voicing here, right, about privacy, data security, things like that. So we're very sensitive to that. We work with them, but none of the cities that we're working with, none of the cities that we partner with for police services are selling that data. Mayor Pitch, you had talked about um, everybody getting having an opportunity or whatever to ask questions in this meeting certainly brings up a lot of questions. I think more than half of us in this room have kind of asked a question. And there may be people that are watching um, on their TVs too. How do they, how do they ask their questions? How, if we have questions tonight while we're sleeping or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I also want to iterate, this is not the first and only time that we're going to do this. So there are going to be multiple town halls, m multiple discussions to give people an opportunity. If they're sitting at home tonight looking at this, or if they listen to the recording later on, and they find that they want more information, come to the next one and get it live. Or send us an email, and we're happy to address it with our partners at the Sheriff's Department. Okay? Other questions? Any other questions? One of the things we're concerned about is most of the cities around us now are signing contracts to do this. If we become the dark hole, that's where the, the, guy, the bad guys are going to learn where to go first. So we don't want to be left out in the sense that we become an attractive uh, uh, on the wrong side of the law. And so that's another area we need. But in my opinion, our committee is not, we have no power. We simply make observations, study it, and then we present it to the city council just like you can. But we are charged with finding problems if there are any. And we've been very fortunate here, our low rate of crime, because you guys are attentive. But yeah, there's still technologies that are beating us. One of the tricks we've learned is in our uh, things we've learned is that they have people that go to knock on doors in a business suit in a brief case and they're selling uh, solars or whatever and they just what they're really doing is casing your house if there's nobody home they got a crew around the corner and that are experts at breaking in and they walk on and go to the next house so this is very professional and it, and it happens in a matter of minutes three minutes or less they know how to do it and we see, we're learning that as a committee. So please uh, take, uh, personal security is one thing, but you don't have it, frankly. So let's rely on our, our sheriff's department, which has done a great job thus far statistically and will continue. Now you bring, we've discussed that actually internally, your point you made how, you know, that because most, in fact, I would venture to say all of our contract city partners are moving in that direction of license plate readers and other technologies to make their community safer. So you do bring up a good point. If there is a city that doesn't have it and something happens here, we'll be a little challenged in how do we address that uh, versus some of the other cities. Well, I have a question about, it brings up the point about, excuse me, brings up the point about <clears throat> are these, uh, all these different softwares or companies, are they interchangeable? Are, can they easily talk to each other? Because you're, you talked about everybody having their own, and of course we're going to have our own, but we would probably need to look at how we can cooperate instantaneously. Not quickly, but instantaneously. Yeah, so great point. So what I talked about at the beginning was where the solutions we're implementing are agnostic to the hardware that you put out. So it doesn't matter what brand of license plate reader camera you have. 
we're making sure on the back end on our infrastructure that we can support those and instantaneously talk to each other and provide that information to our first responders as well as our partner agencies in the county as well. The other point you made earlier about the technology is changing quickly, and I'm in that industry to, that makes all those CCD readers and everything inside the cameras, but it changes so fast. I mean, when you look at a contract with a company, how do, how do you upgrade it, say, every year, or how much does that cost? To your point, how much is it really going to cost in the long run? Yeah, great point, and those are all things that the, that the city will have to look at. There's, there's different options. You can lease cameras, you can buy them, you can have upgrade uh, paths to, you know, to keep your technology fresh. We know that technology is advancing so quickly that whatever we buy and implement today is going to be outdated three to five years from now. By the and, time it ships, it's outdated. Yeah, a absolutely. But, but, but uh, again, it seems to me that maybe from the, from the sheriff's department, you should have a, a guidelines, if you don't already, that everybody should be looking at this particular list of questions. So we, so we have a recommended uh, handout that we provide to the cities that gives them, again, we're not um, making recommendations. What we share with them is technologies and vendors <clears throat> that have had success with other cities. Yeah. Now, because to me, the first people we have to cooperate with is Orange. Obviously, they surround us. So that's, I'm sure that the committee's doing that as well. But anyway, I, I should shut up. No, no. That's, that's what this is for, is to answer your question. So we appreciate your uh, candor and your time. We just had last week. So uh, in unincorporated Anaheim, we had a residential burglary. Uh, a deputy actually was driving down the road. This burglary had not happened yet. He had a license plate reader on his, on his unit, like uh, my partner was talking about. Um, it read that license plate two hours before the burglary actually occurred, but the deputy didn't know because the crime hadn't occurred yet. But it translated it into the flock system. So both of those systems, the license plate reader and the flock system, are interchangeable. So you're going to get that real-time update. But again, the burglary had not occurred yet, but that vehicle was already casing the area. So those are the type of real-time uh, information that's going to help us, you know, solve these crimes for you guys. Yeah, it's a great point you bring up. <clears throat> All of the technologies <clears throat> that we're deploying are designed to work in real time together. And um, you know, another example we can give you is everybody knows the deputies have the MDCs or the computers in their cars. All the deputies now have been issued iPhones because many of the applications we use are mobile friendly. And what we're going to have the capability starting in January is to push in real time that video, whether it be of a, of a car at a crime scene or, or as the sergeant said two hours before, or five minutes after, or real-time video, we're gonna be able to push that feed directly to the deputy. So there's a lot of exciting technologies coming down the pipeline that are gonna make us all safer. Yes, ma'am. We talked about things that are after, after the incident has happened, but what about if these things read and a deputy is driving and somebody comes into the area that is a bad dude or whatever and shouldn't is just driving around or whatever, does the deputy have the opportunity to turn around and say, hey, I noticed a chip in your windshield and just talk to him or whatever and say, what are you doing in our city? Yeah, well, certainly that's a tactic that they use, right? If, if you have a vehicle code violation on your car, that gives us probable cause to stop that vehicle and then we can be looking for other things like that. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about that we can use um, is we can put, we can enter into the flock system or our automated license plate system, um, a license plate or a description of a vehicle. So let's say you come home from work and you have a car that you see in your neighborhood that is driving suspicious. They haven't done anything illegal, but something just doesn't look right, right? And you report that, well, if the deputy or investigator that goes out there or the dispatcher that takes that call feels that it's suspicious enough, they can just enter that into the system. And now, guess what? When these deputies are driving around, that's going to immediately pop up when they pass through one of the stationary cameras or when one of the, they're behind one of the units that's driving around. So there's a lot of ways we can use the technology to help do exactly what you're talking about. Yes, sir. Is 
Is this a deterrent? Do you know if cities that have more of this technology have less crime? So I think that, and I'll let the chief maybe respond to that and from a statistical standpoint, but I can tell you from a technology standpoint, I think from our perspective on the technology side, the technology is so new yet that I don't know if we've had a chance to gather those types of statistics to see the before and after. It's so new. It's just we're just rolling this technology out in our contract cities now this year. One, one thing I can say to that is in, in the cities that we do have, because uh, the rest of my areas are all, all unincorporated, so none of the unincorporated areas have these type of systems. But in the areas that do, it not, it's not necessarily the crime stats that are going up, it's the observed criminal activity that these systems are helping our deputies catch. Those numbers are going up, which means those people aren't committing crime the next day. So, um, but I, like, like Dave said, I don't think we have enough data in a time span of data to really give you, that's more anecdotal than anything. Uh, that's just you know, observations, and if you have anything to add to that. I worked in the city of Stanton as a sergeant as, as well as a deputy, and they have multiple cameras, flock cameras, for instance, and LPRs. Um, you can target areas though that are more problematic, right? But it, there is a, de a decrease of crime in that area. Once a criminal or a crew is aware, like, hey, let's not go into that area because we keep getting caught, right? Because these crews, a lot of them, like I said earlier, are coming from LA County, they're gangs, okay? They all talk to each other. They'll put stuff on eBay that they steal from, from the residences, okay? So we work that angle as well. But once they, f once they see it, an area is hot, like they're getting caught, they're going to stop kind of going there, you know? So um, I, it's hard to measure that right now because, like my chief was saying and, and my partner over there, Dave, um, it's all so new that we haven't, I can't put a number to it, but you will see decreases of criminal activity in those areas because the apprehension is so high. And luckily we live in Orange County where people still do go to jail and stay in jail. You know, we can't really talk much about LA County, but we know how that works, so. We're going to have to pay you overtime here, aren't we? Um, to your point about it being a deterrent, and I don't, if you don't have those statistics, I don't know if you know this one, but you can't possibly cover every entrance and exit to the city. I mean, we probably could in Villa Park because we're so small, but that might be cost prohibitive. So have you seen an increase in areas of cities that don't have the flock cameras? Because, for example, Anaheim. If Anaheim has cameras, they get to know where those cameras are. Do they just then go to another part of the city? Yeah, I don't think we've seen that yet. Um, not saying that won't evolve as the cro crooks become more aware of technology as well. They're smart, just like us, but that's just going to make us be smarter and work harder to stay one step ahead of them. But I don't think we've seen that yet. Has there, uh, maybe this is a generation or two out, is there an integration to any of the public domain camera systems out there, like a GoPro as an example, but there's a whole host of them uh, into any of these systems or not? Uh, the answer is yes, that we are integrating a number of uh, different types of cameras uh, into the system. So from traffic cameras to uh, public buildings to pr even private businesses starting next year will be integrating uh, private business. So if you own a business, you'll be able, you'll have the option to integrate into our system for that real-time situational awareness. The other thing we haven't talked about is schools. So many of the schools are already starting to come online with their cameras and giving us access to those feeds uh, that, again, are going to give us that situational awareness, uh, you know, in a worst-case scenario like an active shooter or something like that. It is, absolutely. Now we'll have, there literally will be thousands and thousands of cameras that we'll have access to, and it's really going to take a lot of technology and manpower to manage that. So.
Well, yeah, absolutely. So there, I think it's a combination. What we see as kind of the best practices, at least at this stage of the technology, is really a layered approach, right, where you have some city-owned cameras, you have some public domain cameras, you have private business cameras. That's really what we see as the best uh, way to blanket a community. Oh, was this good? We can't tell you how much we appreciate you all coming out and spending time with us and telling us about things that are available to us in the city. We've got a long way to go to figure this out. We've got a lot of due diligence to do along with you all, and we'll, we'll do this in concert. But we'll do this again. We'll have some more information for you next time, maybe some more in-depth around the, the types of cameras and things of that nature. So, And if you have questions or comments or whatever, Please feel free to send them over to the city or myself, either one, and we're happy to address them for you after the, after the meeting, okay? Thank you very much. Appreciate you.